as we consider the greatness of who you are and of what you've done for us. Lord, I pray even now as we go to your word, O oh God, that you would speak, that you touch each of us, even those driving by, that they would be touched by you. How we thank you, O oh Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 i got to be careful up here. Oof. Well, we have just begun... What's that? I don't know. Okay. We have just begun our study through Ephesians, and I had a great time on Wednesday night looking at Ephesians chapter 1. We just barely broke into it. What a fantastic book and uh, amazing words for us about the grace of our God and the way that he's chosen us. Let me read a little bit of that for you before the wind takes it away. Ephesians chapter 1, starting in verse 3. Blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavens in Christ. For he chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in love before him. He predestined us to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ for himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he lavished on us in the Beloved One. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he richly poured out on us with all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, that he purposed in Christ as a plan for the right time to bring everything together in Christ, both things in heaven and things on earth, in him. Let's stop there and pray. Lord, I thank you for these words, and I pray, O oh Lord, that as we look at this today, that you would speak to us, that we would hear from you, not from me, but from you. We thank you, Lord. Amen. So we looked at this a little bit on Wednesday. We just broke into it, and I want to give you a little review of uh, verses 3 and 4 before we get into 5 and 6. Verses 3 and 4, Blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us. We talked about that on Wednesday, that he has blessed us. And of course, when we think about the blessings that we have, we think about, you know, the place we have to live or the people that we have around us or the car we drive or the dinner that we eat. But we understand here that he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavens, in Christ. And you say, well, that's nice that we have spiritual blessings and that's nice that we have blessings in heaven. But what about today? I need stuff right now we got to understand the spiritual blessings that are ours in Christ. Those are the real blessings. Those are the eternal blessings. We likened it to being gone in another country and needing something as we were on our way home, knowing that the thing we need is at home for us when we get there. The thing that we really need is at home for us. That's our spiritual blessings in Christ. These are eternal blessings, the things that last, the, thing that we, the things that we really need, the things that will help us to be full and fulfilled even on into the future, forever. And those are in the heavens, in Christ. Nobody can take them away. That's what he's given to us. But we also know that we have some blessings right here, right now, in this life. You don't have to die to experience the blessings of God. They're available for us, and we read about a list of them starting in verse 4. First of all, he chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. He said, those who are in Christ are mine, and they will be holy and blameless. When I look on them, I'll see perfection. I won't see them in the flaws that they like to think about. When I look on them, I'll see them as perfected. And the reason is because they're in Christ who is perfected. So when he looks at you and I who are in him, he sees the beauty and holiness of Christ. He doesn't see all of the failures and flaws that we think about on a regular basis. And then we read, he chose us to be holy and, bless and blameless in, his, in love before us. And then it says, he predestined us to be, as a, to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ for himself. He predestined us to be adopted as sons. So, those who are in Christ, he already determined what he was going to do with them. Those of us who are in Christ, he already knows what he's going to do. We go around saying, hey, Lord, what is your will for me? He already knows. He's already got a plan. And his plan is that we'll be adopted as sons. Now, understand what that means. When we think about adopting someone as a child, we think about, you know, a little baby, right? 
who doesn't have a mom and a dad, and, and, and we come in and we adopt them, and isn't that great? Or maybe it's a kid in foster care, or even a teenager in the system, and we come along and we bring them into our house, and we give them a home, and we give them a family. Understand he's already done that for us. In John chapter 3, he says, you have to be born again. <clears throat> and Nicodemus says, how do I even do that? He said, well, anyone who believes in me has passed from death to life. You're, you're born again. You have this new life right off the bat in Christ. If you are in Christ, well, then you're in Christ. You're in the family. You, you have this new life already, but then there's this new thing. You're adopted as a son. Best way to explain what that means, Paul is referring to a Roman practice that was pretty famous. It was actually made famous by Julius Caesar. You might know Julius Caesar was the last leader of Rome when it was a republic before it became an empire. Julius Caesar was the last leader. There actually was a triumvirate. There were three leaders. He defeated the other two. He was the ultimate leader. But it was still a republic. It wasn't an empire yet. He was working on making it an empire. The problem was he knew he wasn't going to last long enough to do everything that needed to be done politically to make this the empire that he wanted to make it. Somebody else was going to have to take over for him. And that somebody that was going to take over for him was going to have to be his son. Because if you remember, in those days someone who had an adult son, their adult son was an exact representation of them. So uh, Mike has an adult son, London. He's, I mean, we like to think maybe he's an adult. He's old enough to be an adult. So if Mike decides to buy a house, and he goes and secures a mortgage, and now they're heading down to the, uh, the title place to sign all the documents, Mike doesn't have to go. He can send London. London can go in his place and sign his name, and in, in, in the way that things worked in that day, that would be good enough. His adult son has come, therefore, it's as if he has shown up. Well, this is what Caesar needed, was an adult son. Somebody who could operate his seal as, as the princeps, the leader of the government. He needed somebody who could do that job, who could stand in for him, who could be his son, and he didn't have someone qualified for that. But he did have a great nephew, a great nephew named Gaius Octavian. And Gaius Octavian at the time was about 17 years old, so old enough in Rome legally to be an adult. And, and Julius Caesar felt like Gaius Octavian had the makings of what it might eventually take to be a good leader. And he needed somebody right now, so he adopted him as a son. He said, legally, this Gaius Octavian is now Caesar, Caesar Augustus. He now takes the place for me. He can stand in place for me. He owns everything I own. He holds everything I own. This kingdom that is the Roman Republic that I'm the leader of, he's now the leader. He's been adopted as my son. This became a very common practice in the Roman Empire as an emperor was aging and realized he was going to have to replace himself. Rather than just turn it over to anybody, he handpicked his successor and said, this person is my son. They are my complete heir. They own everything I own. They own my name. They own my capability. My kingdom is theirs just as if I were them or they were me. That's what Paul's talking about. He says, for those who are in Christ, who've been born again, who have this new life, God has this new thing that he's going to do or that he has done that he's in the process of doing. He is adopting you as his child. He's handing you the keys to the kingdom. He's saying everything that's mine is yours. You don't need anything because it's already always yours. You're adopted as a son. Now, I know me, and you know you. If you were going to pick somebody to be in charge of all of this, to be the owner of all of this, would you pick you? Right, let's just be honest for a minute. I mean, knowing what you know about you, do you think that's a good idea? Not a it, no, not a chance. It's definitely not a chance for me. So why did he do it? Well, it tells us why he did it, according to the good pleasure of his will. It literally, out of benevolence, he wanted to. Because he saw you, and he said, I love that one enough. They're not what, they're not what they need to be now. There's no getting around it. But I'm going to make them that way. I'm going to bring them in, and I'm going to give them this responsibility and these rights and these privileges, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make them into what I need. Why did he do that? 
Why didn't he just like pick the perfect one already? Well, it tells us why. To the praise of his glorious grace that he lavished on us in the beloved one. To the praise of his glorious grace. Because if he would have picked the best that there was, anybody can do that. Imagine that the NFL decides that they're going to uh, have some more expansion teams. We're going to add some football teams this year. And so they go around looking for good cities to add football teams, and they decide Mount Vernon, Washington. Pretty good place. They should have their own, they should have their own football team. I mean, listen, we have the stadium over at the high school. That'll work, right? So here we are, the Mount Vernon, what, the Mount Vernon Mushrooms? I mean, you can't, Mount Vernon Tulips, kind of, but it doesn't really, I don't know, the, the Mount Vernon, Mount Vernon people, I, I don't, I don't know, they just, they, they give us a name, and they hire us a coach, and, and, and they decide that the coach that, that they're going to hire is Julie Gates, so Julie's now the football coach, and Julie needs to put, get, put together a team, and the owner of this new NFL team has a lot of money. So Julie gets on her phone and she Googles who are the best players in the NFL right now. The best quarter who's the best quarterback in the NFL right now? Anybody know? I don't I don't know. I might have said Aaron Rodgers, but he ain't playing. Yeah, some some whoever they pick the best one. And and the owner hires him up and, and says, you know, I, I want you to be the new leader of the Mount Vernon whatever's and so that football player comes and he's now the quarterback. And, 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 and the owner just goes down the line and picks the best players in the league and snatches them out of other teams and brings them here to Mount Vernon so that Mount Vernon has the best players in the entire NFL, first string and second string, right here practicing on our high school football field. And then all of a sudden it's August and it's time to play games and the Mount Vernon team goes out and wins some. I mean, you can't win them all. But by the end of the time, I mean, you got like a 10-2 and two record. By the time we're heading for the Super Bowl, that's pretty darn good. What's everybody going to say? Well, of course, they have the best players. Duh. They have the best players. I mean, Julie, she probably did okay with them, but come on. Really, what it comes down to is they have the best players. Imagine instead the owner of this new football team is flat broke. He really didn't have any money. He got Julie. He hired her. She says, Julie, we're going to need a team. And she's like, well, Mike Roberts, he, he'd probably be a pretty good lineman, defensive lineman. So we're going to hire, we're going to hire him. And, 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 and David Brown, he, he'd probably throw a ball pretty well. I know Levi can throw a ball pretty well. So those are, those are first and second string quarterbacks. You guys can duke it out which one's going to be which. And uh, Jackson over there, he can really run people down. So, so he's going to be our receiver, I guess. And Riley is a really tall guy. So he's going to be our he's going to be our field goal kicker, and and that's that's what we got, and that's all we can afford. And imagine this team goes out on the first Sunday morning up against the Detroit Lions and wallops them. Well, yeah, but that was the Lions. <laughs> so next week they're up against Green Bay Packers and they wallop them. And they keep doing this week after week after week until finally it's time for Super Bowl, and it's a 12-0 and record, won everything there is to win, heading to the Super Bowl as the favorites. What is the world going to say about our coach, Julie? She really knows what she's doing because these players, sorry, Levi, are not people I would have picked for the NFL. She must be brilliant as a coach. Listen, listen. God picked us. Not because of how good we are. Matter of fact, he tells us in Deuteronomy chapter 7, he, he picked us because we were the weakest losers available. He picked us, honestly, not because we're good, but because at the end of the day, we were the ones nobody else picked. And he said, these are the ones I can use to show the glories of my grace. Because when people look at us, and see us all getting together out here and as the day progresses and more people come and we've got multiple languages and people hanging out together, the people driving by are going to be like, what's up with them? What makes them able to do that? Huh. His glorious grace, that's all. His glorious grace. People look at us and they say, wow, your God must be pretty darn special. 
to pull that off. And we say, yeah, he lavished on us his glorious grace. You know what that means to lavish on us? I have a friend who lives in northern Maine. He sends me pictures of the snow every year. He is lavished on. I mean, we're talking six, eight feet of snow on his church parking lot that they got to try to plow off repeatedly throughout the winter. But that's, that's not this kind of lavish. That's a lot of snow. But it would be like if they collected all that snow in those great big dump trucks they use for mining. You've seen those things. They're so big it wouldn't hardly fit in those fields. If they collected all the snow in those great big dump trucks and just came and backed up and dumped it on us over and over and over and over again. That's what it means to lavish. That's what his grace, what he's done with his grace for us is absolutely poured it out on us like that to the point when people look at us, all they see is his grace. I was thinking about a way to illustrate this for you this morning, and I thought of a story I know about a dog. The dog's name is Tyson, and after Mike Tyson. Not because he's cool and strong, but because he fights with everything. And one time he got in a fight and bit off a chunk of another dog's ear, so they knew him Tyson. He was at a pound at a, at a humane society from the time that he was about seven months old. He was so unruly to the family that was trying to raise him that they just dropped him off at the pound. By the time he got to the pound, he was pretty matted up and kind of disgusting looking and bad smelling and they couldn't even tell what breed he was. They thought maybe he was some kind of pointer or hunting dog. They just called him a mutt. They really didn't know what kind of a breed he was. It was the Humane Society that named him Tyson because of his, well, his fighting. He just, he fought with every dog, every person. People figured he was just really scared. And the way that he dealt with being scared was just by attacking everything. He spent the next two and a half years there in the pound in the Humane Society. A couple of different families had tried to adopt him, but they brought him back because he just refused to get along. He would not housebreak. He would not follow the rules. He ripped their houses up. He ripped their yards up. He attacked their other animals. He, he was so angry and bitter that most of the time he wouldn't even eat. So they just brought him back to the pound and said, he, if he stays with us, he's going to die. We don't know what to do with him. So there he languished in the, humans, in the Humane Society for about two and a half years. Then one day, a man showed up wearing a nice business suit. He looked like a lawyer or something. Nice wool suit. He showed up there at the counter at the Humane Society. He said, I'd like to adopt a dog. And they said, great, we have many really good choices. We have some puppies that are here. Maybe you'd like a puppy. Or if you don't want to train a dog, we have some dogs that we've been working on training that are ready to go that are about a year old. That might be really good for you. We have a lot of options. Come back and take a look. He said, oh, no. He said, I don't need to look. I've already decided which dog I want. I decided I want Tyson. And they said, sir, maybe you don't understand Tyson. Maybe you saw him on the website and there's a cute picture or something there, but you've got to understand he is by far the most difficult dog we have ever had. He attacks everything and everyone. He refuses to deal with humans. If you took him to your house, he would destroy your house. The man said, oh, he said, my home is prepared. He said, I have a beautiful yard already all laid out, nice fence all the way around it. I have a beautiful dog house for him. In my house, I have a bed that I've brought in and some toys, and I've prepared the house. I am ready for Tyson. They said, sir, I don't, I don't think you understand. But if you really want to see him, come on back. So the man in his business suit walked back into the area where they keep the dogs, and there's Tyson in one of those little kennels that they keep them in in the pound, and Tyson is already growling and snarling as they walk up. Y you can't tell what color he is. He's so dirty. He's got scabs all over him from the fights that he's gotten in and mange all over his coat because he won't even let people mess with him to clean him. The man says, yep, that's Tyson. That's the one I want. And they say, well, listen, we're going to open the door of the kennel and let you see if you can even get along with him. So they opened the door of the kennel, and sure enough, Tyson starts to snarl like they do. And he went back into the back corner of the kennel, you know, like a dog who's afraid will do, and, and stood there snarling defensively in the back corner. And the man just, in his nice real business suit, stepped right in that kennel and turned around and sat on the floor of that kennel in his suit and just waited patiently. He waited like that for a couple hours. Tyson eventually stopped snarling, but that was really about all they got. The man 
said, I'm going to take Tyson, but I, and I'm going to go ahead and pay for him now, but I'm not going to take him home today. I don't think Tyson's ready. And so the man continued to come back day after day after day for about three months after work in his suit into the kennel and sat down in the kennel with Tyson every day for a few hours for about three months until finally Tyson realized the man was not going to hurt him. Over time, the man was able to feed him, even from his hand. Over time, the man was able to put a lead on him, a leash on him, and over time, Tyson allowed the man to lead him out of the kennel on the leash, and over time, into his car and to his home. And that was the last the Humane Society heard about it. And they thought to themselves, boy, are we glad Tyson is gone. I don't think they said we could have tolerated another day with them. And secretly, they feared for the man's house and property, knowing that a man that was dressed like that, that had such that kind of attitude, must have a beautiful home and a really nice yard, and Tyson was about to destroy it. They didn't think anything of it. Totally forgot about the dog in time. Fast forward a couple years later, the leader of the Humane Society there, the, the CEO, was one of the people that was called on to judge the uh, big kennel club show, kind of like the Westminster Kennel Club show, but more of a regional show. She went to the show to do the judging, and, and, and you know they have all the different categories and all the different things that they have to judge, and they have the agility trials and everything else. Well, at the show, there was a beautiful German short-haired pointer, just a gorgeous dog tail cropped properly, ears just right, looking beautiful. You know, I, I don't know if you're into German short-haired pointers, but if you get the right one, they have kind of a brown and tan and white speckled coat that's just fantastic. And this guy, this particular German, shepherd point, or, uh, German short-haired pointer, must have been five, six years old, was an absolutely perfect example. I mean, just textbook. The dog stood just right with the tail out like it's supposed to, head pointing properly. Just a, an amazing dog. And everybody was taken by this dog and, and its abilities in, in, in showing the, the person showing the dog. You know, they have a, a professional person that walks the dog around and all that. As they, as they told the dog what to do and it followed the person, it did everything you're supposed to do absolutely perfectly. It was just it, it, the best example of a purebred German short-haired pointer anybody had ever seen. It came time for the agility trials. I love watching the agility trials because you have like the border collies that can do everything, right? And then you have like the English Mastiff that can't even do the little weave through the thing because they're so big and lazy. Normally, the border collies take that. I mean, come on, it's slam dunk for a border collie. But in this case, this pointer had it nailed. He just followed every command of the presenter, the person that was, that was presenting the dog. He followed every command. He went everywhere that he was supposed to go. He did it so efficiently. He, the dog was so well-trained and so obedient. It just did everything it was supposed to do beautifully. It was fantastic. So, of course, the dog won best in show. I mean, it was best in its class. It was best in the agility trials. It was a slam dunk. Of course, the dog's going to win best in show. And so they come up to the dog, and they, they give the dog a ribbon, and they talk to the handler of the dog and all of that. And, and, they, and, and as the judges came up to talk to the handler, they said, so are you just the handler, or is this your dog? Oh, no, no. They said, I'm just the handler. The owner is over there. And over there, standing on the sidelines, it's a man in a nice wool suit, looking like a lawyer. And the Humane Society lady said, I've seen that guy before. I think that's the guy that adopted Tyson. So she waited, and the dogs were released. And, of course, this German short-haired pointer ran right, right over to the guy. And he, you know, greeted him like you do. And the dog was so excited to see him and all that. And the Humane Society came, lady came over, and she said, I didn't know you had other dogs. She said, I didn't know you. You must be like a breeder or something. You must, you must raise pointers to have a dog like this. I, I didn't know you did that. And he said, what are you talking about? And she said, well, I know you adopted Tyson, but, but this dog here is fantastic. By the way, she said, how's Tyson doing? How do you do with your other dogs? He said, I don't have any other dogs. He said, this is Tyson. I took him home. I loved him. I spent time with him. I trained him. I led him along because I could see in him was this beautiful dog. I could see what was in him the whole time. And so I brought him home and I lavished on him love and praise and grace. 
I, I made him my, my companion going to work with me every day, spending every minute with me at home. And, and this is what the dogs become. The Humane Society lady could do nothing but lavish on this man great praise. She knew it wasn't because of Tyson. She'd seen what he was like. It was because of how this man had treated the dog. I wish I could say it's a true story. It's an analogy. It's a picture of what God has done for us. How he finds us in ourselves. And quite frankly, we ain't no good for nobody. We're not even good for ourselves. And he gets to work on us. He lavishes on us his grace. He gives us adoption as his sons. He chooses us. He brings us to his home and puts us in it and gives us a position because there's something that he knows that we can be. One more story. In 1501, some miners, or I should say some uh, quarry workers in Italy, quarried out a big chunk of marble they thought would be perfect for these sculptures that all these, all these artists are making during the period we now know as the Renaissance. This is a true story. So they loaded it up, and they took it to Donatello, the famous sculptor Donatello, and they offered him this chunk of marble, and Donatello said, I won't have it. It's flawed. It's not good enough. I won't use it. Well, they thought they were going to make big bucks selling this thing to Donatello, but he said no. And since Donatello said no, everybody else said no. So here they got this quarried stone they can't sell because everybody says it's just not good enough. They finally took it to a fairly new sculptor that was just starting to make a, a go on the scene, a man named Michelangelo. And they said, we'll sell you this marble at a discounted rate. And he said, well, it's beautiful. He said, the quote is, there's an angel inside, and I must free it, he said. And he took that rejected chunk of marble, and he carved out of it the statue that we call David. You've seen the David statue. It is considered the most beautiful statue of the Renaissance period. It's the symbol of the Renaissance in Italy, the David statue, out of a chunk of stone that was rejected because it was flawed. But Michelangelo chose it. What we're hearing here is that God has chosen us. He has adopted us. He has lavished on us his grace because he loves us and he has a plan for us. And I think that's absolutely fantastic. And I think if you're not in Christ today, you might want to consider becoming in Christ. This is what he has chosen to do for those who are in him. And that's easy to do. We read in John chapter 3 and again in John chapter 5 and in 7 and, well, a number of other places. All we have to do is believe. All we have to do is believe in him. Now, that's not just this cognitive idea that, yeah, I'm pretty sure that Jesus walked on the earth. I believe that. No, this is a belief in your heart where you say, I'm so convinced of who Christ is and what he's done that I'm going to stake my life on it. I'm going to give him my life from this point on. And then you are in Christ, and you are adopted as a son, and you are brought into the heavenlies with him, and you are given great blessings, and he works to sanctify you and make you what only he can make you. And that's a fantastic opportunity presented to us right here in Ephesians 1. So let's stop and pray. Take a moment to consider your position in Christ. Thank him for what he's doing in your life. Ask him to do what he can. Let's pray. Lord, how we thank you that you have chosen us and adopted us. We thank you that you have led us and made us. We thank you, Lord, that at a time when everyone else had rejected us, everyone else said we are not good enough. Even we said we are not good enough. You said there's an angel inside. You said I can see what this person will be in my grace. Lord, I pray that we all can say that we are in Christ. And if there's anyone here, Lord, that is not committed to you to say, I want to be hidden in you, Lord, I pray that today they would call on you and acknowledge how much they need you and set aside what they've been so that they can be what only you can make them. How I thank you, Lord, for these people and this fantastic opportunity you've given to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand with us as we close in worship. <laughs>